Hello all, I am Robin Hansen, uh, giving a talk here in Second Life on the age of Ev, work, love, and life when robots rule the Earth. Uh, the slide you hopefully see in front of you at the moment is the uh, U.S. economy over the last few years. Every one of those bumps uh, was big news when the economy went up or down a bit. But we're going to talk about much bigger news. The next slide shows the entire world economy over the last half century ago. And now on the y-axis, we have a logarithm of growth. On the x-axis, we have time. And it's roughly a line which says it's been roughly exponential growth for the last half century ago, which is the main news in the world uh, as of late. But if we go back even farther, you'll see that uh, over the last 2,000 years, it's not a line. So there was this great revolution, the Industrial Revolution, sometime in the last few hundred years, uh, where by yeah. the looked like there wasn't growth, and then in the last century or so, we've had the world economy doubling roughly every 15 years. But if you go back even farther, you'll see that uh, even before then, it really was growth. It was uh, slower growth, however, and uh, even before the farming uh, revolution, there was even slower growth, and before humans, apparently there was even slower growth of brains that was roughly exponential. And before that, it seems like the growth of genomes at an even slower exponential rate. And if you just take the last uh, few cycles of human growth, it actually fits pretty well as a sequence of exponential modes, uh, i.e. relatively steady growth and then sudden transitions to faster growth modes. Uh, we can actually collect these all as numbers in terms of the uh, doubling time of each mode and how many doubles they went through, and there's a relatively consistent pattern. But I want to show it all on the following graph. Now. Here on the y-axis, we have growth rates. And on the x-axis, we've moved to a logarithm of time. And so now we can fit uh, many modes all together on the same graph. So we have very slow growth of animal brains, then a relatively sudden transition to uh, a faster growth of human foragers with culture doubling roughly every quarter million years. Uh, then roughly around 10,000 years ago, a sudden jump to farming doubling roughly every thousand years. Uh, uh, years ago, roughly uh, growth to the industrial era doubling every 15 years. And this is a great question of whether it could happen next, uh, whether there could be another jump to an even faster growth mode. And if we follow the same pattern as the last few jumps, uh, what we would see is that in the next century, not very precise, uh, we would see within, say, five years, a transition to the economy doubling every month or so, uh, which is a fantastic growth rate. What could possibly cause that? Uh, one of the most common speculations is uh, smart robots, artificial intelligence. And uh, there are several possible scenarios that uh, people have talked about how that could happen. For the last 70 years or so, we've been trying to write better software. I used to be an AI researcher in that field, and I've been in the habit of asking people who have been in that field for at least 20 years, how far have we come in your specialty subfield in that time? And they usually say 5 to 10 percent of the distance, which at that rate would say two to four centuries it will take to eventually reach full AI. Now, uh, some people think that uh, past progress is no indication of future progress, and we're going to discover uh, at some point some great theory that will uh, burst us everything forward, and everything will happen real fast then. That's uh, approach number two. I'm going to talk about approach number three. Uh, this is uh, the brain emulation approach. It's like porting software that's already in the human brain. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with that idea here. I don't have to explain the key idea of uh, brain emulation so much. Uh, but I'm focused on the scenario where that's what happens first. I.e., that's the first form of human level artificial intelligence. So as you probably know, the main thing you need three main things to make it work. We need lots of cheap, fast parallel computers. We need to span, scan particular brains in fine spatial and chemical detail. And then we need to have models of how each kind of uh, brain cell works, or models of their input-output signal processing behavior. And if we have good enough models of the cells, and good enough scans, then we'll have a good enough model of the whole thing, i.e. would have the same input-output behavior of the whole brain, so you could hook it up with hands, eyes, ears, or mouth, and um, it would talk back. It might do jobs if you asked it nicely. Uh, that's the transition. That's the technology I'm focused on. What happens if that is feasible and cheap? Uh, many 
Now, how long this will take depends on how deep into the structure of the brain we have to do, go to model uh, the appropriate signal processing. Uh, if we don't have to go very far, then computers can be cheap enough to do it uh, relatively soon. If we have to go really deep, it may take a century, uh, but roughly sometime in the next century is how long it would take at, say, traditional Moore's Law growth rates. Now, um, I and probably many of you have been around people speculating about this idea for many decades. Uh, when the topic comes up, usually people get focused on, is it even possible? Uh, uh, if we made one, would they be conscious, or are they just machines? If we made one of me, would it be me, or is it someone else? Uh, what technologies would make it possible, etc.? Uh, I have gotten tired of all those questions, and I decided to focus on what I thought was the neglected question, the question other people haven't been talking about, which is what would actually happen if we had such things? How does the world actually change? And so I've just written this book uh, out. June 1st in the U.S., a little early in the United Kingdom, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life on Robots Here of the Earth. It's gotten some nice press, uh, some critical press, but at least they haven't ignored me, which is nice. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that book here, what I've done. Now, first I want to talk about why I've done it and how I've done it. Um, if you look at Amazon keywords, you'll find that roughly 20% uh, of books have a keyword history, but only 1% of the books have keyword future, uh, which I might find puzzling if we can do more about the future than we can about the past, and uh, especially since there's roughly equal interest in historical and future fiction. I would say that um, the main reason people give is that it's impossible to study the future, and it's possible to study the past. That's why we don't have much future, and I've written this book in part to try to prove that wrong. Uh, you can think about three kinds of futurism. One kind is uh, just projecting current trends, like uh, reduced uh, religion, uh, increased leisure, uh, et cetera, more divorce, whatever trends, people have, uh, project trends forward. Another is look forward for trend disrupting technologies like, say, blockchain or self driving cars. And a third approach is to try to look at one of these disrupting technologies and ask, what would the consequences be? And many people seem to think that third approach is impossible. Uh, often there are people who know a lot of technology but not much social science and don't think social science exists. So again, I'm trying to prove that that sort of thing is possible. Um, now, apparently, I've drifted out of my view of my screen. Uh, one of the ways I'm able to uh, do this book is that um, this is a map of academia showing all the different areas uh, connected by co-citation analysis. Uh, it turns out to be a ring. And the highlighted areas here are the ones that I've uh, studied in my life and can bring to bear on this topic, uh, which is an unusually wide range of topics. So, um, seem to have. Uh, just lost something there. Is this out of order? No. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> let me just say that the, um, oddly, I've got the slides here. Uh, they're not in the, the uh, list of slides here. Uh, but I'll just talk to them. Uh, another approach is to just take the low-hanging fruit. I've, uh, in each of these areas, I've tried to just take the easy results. And uh, whenever I can uh, use basic results and just apply them, I, uh, I do. And when things get complicated, I go on to the next thing. I do look for my keys under the lamppost in the sense that I uh, make simplifying assumptions as necessary so that I can get concrete results. I tend to uh, use efficiency, which is a sort of analysis that economists do and engineers do. Uh, historians have often used efficiency to understand the past, i.e., say, uh, predicting the farms are run roughly efficiently, tells you a lot about farms in the past. And so let me summarize my overall method before I tell you some of my results. Um, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm just uh, trying to apply academic consensus, not be especially creative or original, other than just applying standard results. I'm not going to talk very much about what should be. I'm trying to talk about what is. It's not my job to make you like this world. Uh, mainly to just describe it as best I can, uh, what's most likely to be if we do little to make it otherwise. I'm going to focus on the emulations of the robots. Humans, uh, not that much happens to them in this world, so there's not that much to say, but I will say some. I'm focused on the next great era after ours, uh, not the entire the trillions of years future of the entire universe. Uh, I think it's ambitious enough to just tell you about the next era, and uh, I'm not going to say what happens afterwards. I'm going to focus not on the transition, but 
uh, the equilibrium once this world appears and people are used to it. I'm going to take the usual economist uh, style of the simplifying assumption of supply and demand, i.e. lots of competition, relatively low regulation. And for the emulations themselves, I'm going to take the simplifying assumption, which I think is reasonable, at least in the early, early era, that they're mostly opaque black boxes. So you can uh, turn them on, turn them off, uh, copy them, uh, run them fast, run them slow, erase them, but you uh, really can't do much else to them in terms of taking pieces apart or changing them. So those are my uh, working assumptions of this analysis. And from here on, I'm just going to tell you about the results that I got from applying this analysis. Uh, so again, some things I can tell you are just uh, based on uh, robots in general, uh, what they're like, uh, if the world is dominated by robots, not this kind of robot. Uh, robots are in principle immortal, they're represented in computer files. That doesn't mean they are actually immortal, because uh, just like today, houses and cars are immortal if you keep repairing them, but we don't always keep repairing them. Robots can uh, talk, sorry, travel electronically. Robots um, can therefore travel long distance electronically. Uh, robots are made in factories, so uh, we know that uh, there is, uh, they don't fear destruction uh, of nature as much as we do. They know that if uh, they were to somehow destroy nature, they would continue. And finally, uh, uh, robots, you can make copies of them, and that, that has enormous implications. Uh, the most straightforward, obvious implication many people have noticed is that if you can make robots cheaply in factories, then the supply of labor greatly increases, and that makes wages fall to subsistence levels, uh, and which is much below the human subsistence level, and so uh, that's a key issue. Uh, it also changes the uh, growth rate of the economy. Today, to grow, the economy needs both labor and capital, uh, people and machines, uh, one way to try to grow is to just add a lot of machines, uh, but it turns out there's diminishing returns, i.e. it's not really that much more valuable to have lots of machines if you have the same number of workers. They can't really use that many machines at a time. You could grow if you could grow a lot more workers, but we don't actually grow workers that fast. Uh, certainly not enough to make our economy double every 15 years. Uh, so how do we grow? We grow now by innovating, by making better machines, and that's the main way that we've been able to grow much faster than we grow the number of people. However, if you could make robots that substitute directly for humans, then uh, those robots, well, if you make them as fast in factories as fast as you can make machines, you could uh, make the economy grow much faster. In fact, at the usual rates we can grow things in factories, uh, that plausibly could make the economy double every month. Uh, that's not crazy, just given economic theory. Uh, if the economy doubles every month, or even faster, uh, then space travel becomes prohibitively expensive. It takes a year to get to Mars and back, and that's just uh, the opportunity cost is way too high. Right. So, uh, for a while at least, there's relatively little space travel. For the emulations themselves, uh, they can have a more variety of lives than we do. So, uh, on this diagram on the far right, left is your life. You start and then you end. The second uh, diagram over is the life of someone who's an emulation who every day can split off a few short-term copies, which then uh, do some short-term tasks like stay in line at the DMV, and then they end or retire after that short time. Uh, this is very attractive uh, productivity-wise because the main line has to rest for half or more of the day before they're ready to work again. But these short-term copies, they are ready at the beginning to work and all of their life is spent working. Uh, so that's uh, much more efficient. We'll talk more about uh, whether that's acceptable. The, the, the one in the middle, diagram in the middle here is a more opportunistic end who just tries various things. Sometimes they're more in demand, sometimes they're less in demand. They end up with a, not really knowing where things will go. The fourth diagram here is of an M designer. This is someone who conceives of a whole system and then makes themselves into copies which focus on subsystems and uh, recursively down until they design and specify uh, all the details of the system. And then by the end, uh, they can check each part and test them. And this allows them to design uh, a much larger, more coherent holes than humans can today, because they can have many copies who focus on the details. The far right diagram here is an emulation uh, plumber who uh, 
remembers uh, 20 years of only ever working two hours a day. Every day, uh, when they're ready for work, they make a thousand copies of this plumber, who go out and do a thousand two-hour work uh, plumbing tasks, and then at the end, only one of them continues on to the next day. And so, objectively, they're working uh, well over 99% of the time, but subjectively, they feel like uh, they're living a life of leisure. We know a lot of different systems, including human brains, that seem to have the feature that as they adapt to some circumstances, they become more fragile and harder to readapt to other circumstances. For brains, this is called moving from fluid to crystallized intelligence, but we see similar phenomena in software, in species, in cells, in pro consumer products. Uh, and so this suggests there's a general pattern uh, that things eventually, when they adapt, become fragile. And this suggests that M's will have a limited career length before they must retire. They may be able to live forever after they retire, but uh, they would only last for maybe a half century or a couple centuries as a productive worker before younger workers would uh, displace them. So you would continue to go back to the original copy and make new versions and train them in new ways. And this means emulations would tend to have uh, younger and older versions of themselves around in the world so they could uh, see very clearly uh, what their future is likely to be like, uh, not only at work, but also in the relationships and uh, family and things like that. So now we get to uh, this uh, key question. On, on the left um, is you, you start and then you end. In the middle of this diagram is someone who at the beginning of a party takes a drug, which means that the next day and ever after they won't remember the party. So their memories are taken from them at the beginning of the party. Uh, and during this party, they might enjoy the extra freedom of not being able to, uh, you know, worry about how they'll think about it later. Uh, at the end of the party, will they say to themselves, I'm about to die, this is terrible, why did I let myself get into this situation? You could think that you are a separate creature at this party who is about to die, because no one will ever remember what you think and, and feel at this moment. Or you could think this is just a part of yourself that you won't remember later, but you will continue on. On the right uh, diagram, you can see this is a M spur. This is where uh, an M splits off a copy that lasts for a short time and then ends after doing a task. It has the same basic structure. There's a part of you, you can think of it as a part of you that lasts for a while and then ends, and it's part of you that you don't remember, but it's still you, or you can think about it as a separate creature who has a very short life and is about to die. Uh, many people have said they would think about it in that second way, this would be terrible, so M's would not accept this and kind of do this. Uh, but uh, since you can think about it the other way, I predict that M's will in fact think about it that way. Even if most humans don't think about it that way, M's economy will select those who uh, do tend to think about it that way, and they'll be it's a very competitive economy with big advantages to those who do things more productively, and so most M's will do it that way. Uh, it, it, even if M's are okay with short-term copies at end, uh, it can be disruptive if uh, you talk with a friend and then later on they don't remember what you said, so it would probably be simpler for M's to copy whole teams together and then mainly socialize within those teams that uh, simplifies a lot of these uh, issues about who's around and who remembers talking to you. M's also have a uh, nice interesting feature that they can uh, share secrets in a certain way. Yeah. So today uh, it's hard to meet celebrities, they're rare, uh, but for M's it's easy to meet celebrities because uh, they uh, can easily just make more copies to meet with whoever they want. You can meet with president if you like. The hard part is to get the celebrity, say the president, to remember what you said because uh, these copies would be short term and not, then not remembered. But this allows uh, a nice way to share secrets. So imagine that uh, the president or someone says, we must invade Iraq, we, we must do some policy decision. And you ask why, and they said, sorry, there's state secrets, I can't tell you why. Uh, in the emulation world, uh, they could split off a copy and you could split off a copy and both of them can go inside the safe and inside the safe they could explain the reasons to you. And then uh, at the end, you would just decide whether you were persuaded or not. And out of the safe would only come one bit, yes or no, I was persuaded. And in this way, uh, you could find out that you were in fact by display persuaded by their secret reasons, even if they couldn't tell you what they were. Uh, now, as I said, humans in this world are uh, on the margin. They're not the center of attention, but they do exist. Uh, they have to retire. So uh, because humans uh, can no longer earn wages uh, enough to survive, 
uh, they must subsist on their investments, i.e. they might still own real estate and stock and patents in this new world. And in fact, if this economy is doubling every month, uh, their investments double every month, and they'll start out pretty owning pretty much everything. So collectively, humans are very rich and getting rich very fast. However, whether any one human does okay depends on uh, how much wealth they have to start with. So uh, humans who don't have wealth or uh, some form of insurance or some uh, other people who want to share with them will definitely be trouble. Uh, what will be the typical case? Uh, my safe prediction is that since this sort of thing has varied a lot in history, it will vary a lot uh, in the future. Uh, some places they'll have enough insurance and uh, investment and uh, sharing, and other places they won't. Now, uh, all this, pretty much all M started out as humans. They were scanned and then they became emulations. So they're pretty much all within the human range of personality, but they are not typical humans. So if we spread out humans on some axis of how they might vary, say hardworking or smart, emulations will be um, at the tail end of the distribution, i.e. the most productive. So emulations are selected for being the most productive humans. Probably most emulations are copies of a few hundred most productive humans. So that makes emulations compared to humans more elite than the typical Olympic gold medalist, Nobel Prize winner, head of state, billionaire, etc. And we know a lot of things about how productive people in our world differ from the average person, and so we can use that to predict various features of the emulations. They'll tend to be more smart, conscientious, extroverted, etc. Uh, probably even married or religious. They'll tend to be near a peak age of their career. Most emulations are at the peak of their career, just uh, a peak of productivity. Uh, and but again, they're still within the range of human variation. Uh, most emulations are working most of the time, not all of the time, but still most of the time. Uh, most of them work at desk jobs, uh, just like in our economy. Most jobs are desk jobs. Uh, because uh, they are in computers, they might as well be in a virtual reality. And virtual reality can be very cheap to create gorgeous, beautiful virtual reality relative to the cost of just running a brain. And so most emulations uh, can be in beautiful virtual realities like shown in these uh, depictions. However, notice that while these are beautiful and luxurious, they are all offices, they're all desks, because emulations are, in fact, working most of the time. Now, culturally, uh, this is somewhat more speculative. Uh, I think the biggest, uh, most traumatic transition for humanity has ever been was the transition from foraging to farming. Uh, Foragers were relatively in equilibrium with their environment and their, their, their lifestyle and the way they felt. And then the farming world became possible, and it was only possible because humans have enormous cultural plasticity, the ability to, for culture to change and therefore change how people feel about things and relate to things. And so uh, farming used conformity pressures and religious pressures and everything it could find to crank up the pressure to turn foragers into farmers which didn't come quite so natural, but it still uh, worked. And so during the farming era, they had the uh, different sort of values you see on the right-hand slide of this graph. And plausibly, these two categories roughly match onto liberal versus um, conservative. And in the last few hundred years, as we've gotten rich, there's been a consistent trend back toward these more forger or liberal style attitudes and, and behaviors, um, including not only democracy, anti-slavery, more promiscuity, more leisure, travel, etc. And uh, that's been a trend many people are proud of over the last few hundred years. Uh, my prediction is that in the emulation world, they would move back more toward the farming way, uh, especially at work, uh, because uh, those the farming uh, style culture was sort of something that could take people and make them do things that were somewhat alien to their nature and, and get them used to it and think it was the right way of doing things. And the emulation world does need uh, people to do some somewhat strange things. So that's my guess about uh, emulation culture, is that it moves back more toward the farmer uh, or more conservative cultural level. Uh, today, our, our life consists of three main phases. We uh, train, uh, then we are working, and then we're retiring. Uh, emulations would have these three main phases, but uh, most of their actual expense would be in the work phase. They, just, they can have one main copy or a smaller number of copies who train, and then you make many copies of those who do the work. And then they retire, they can retire at a slower speed. So uh, computer emulations can be run at multiple speeds, and the cost is proportional to the speed. So one way to allow people to retire but not make it very expensive is to have them retire at a slower speed. And this ability to have different speeds uh, means they would match their jobs to the uh, speed required best for their job. So 
Some jobs uh, don't require very fast responses to things and they would have slow emulations. Others uh, could productively use very fast emulations. And uh, fast and slow emulations would really be uh, living in different worlds and they would have different cultures. Their cultures would fragment. So to a very fast emulation, it's a world of rock that hardly changes and you'll have to find a few tunnels in the mountains where you can uh, do things and change things. Whereas to slow emulations, it's a world of fast buzzing insects where you should keep your fingers out otherwise they'll get bitten off by all the fast buzzing things you don't understand. Uh, this uh, emulations would run at a wide range of speeds. This, this uh, range over which if you pay twice as much you can have them run twice as fast probably goes up to a million times faster than human and, and plausibly down to a billion times slower than human. So there's this enormous range and uh, they, over this range, uh, faster speed emulations have many of the characteristics that we associate with high status today. They host meetings, they are wealth, embody more wealth, they win arguments, they know about things faster. And slower emulations, especially once they retired, are more ghostly. That is, they are less in touch, they are less influential, they are less aware, it's less interesting to talk to them, uh, they're more obsessed with old things. Uh, so it's a world of really liberal ghosts. And emulations not only run at different speeds, they probably clump into speed so that they can uh, interact with others at the same speed. And this means that uh, it's a class hierarchy, a literal class hierarchy, where the classes uh, who are higher are much more objectively uh, better and uh, worth more and uh, more elite. Uh, and everybody kind of accepts that. Uh, I'll skip talking about, so, I mean, if you ask, I can say more software engineering and cities, uh, infrastructure, city sizes and speeds. I have also slides to tell you about inequality. Um, but I'm going to uh, summarize now with some key statistics and then end the talk and open for questions. So roughly sometime in the next century, not very precise, it will be a, a rapid transition, only a few years. Um, and the entire next era I'm talking about may only last a year or two until something else happens. During this era, the typical, uh, the economy might double roughly every month, but the typical emulation who runs roughly a thousand times human speed, I didn't explain why in the talk, uh, for them it would be an, uh, an era that lasts thousands of years. Uh, they have an enormous range of speeds, uh, but most emulations come from only a few hundred uh, humans, and so uh, there's a high inequality in the transition from humans to emulations, and they would cram very densely into a small number of very dense uh, big city states. So if you want to think about whether you like this or not, again, I haven't emphasized that, but I'm sure other people want to think about it, I can list some pluses and minuses for you, and this is my last slide here. So on the plus side, uh, since they live in virtual reality, uh, they need uh, never experience pain or hunger or grit or disease. Uh, their bodies are always beautiful. They actually have uh, less reason to be afraid of death, I can explain. They have a vast uh, population that experiences things quickly and at least from its own point of view sees its lives worth living. Uh, they're in huge intricate cities. Many of you uh, may look at us people who live in a small town and say you couldn't possibly live there. There's not enough going on. You need your big city. Well, to them, your cities are small and they might think that about yours because they live in much more intricate cities. The world is much larger and able to support better art and stories and even drugs. Uh, relative to the ordinary human, they're extremely capable and virtuous. Uh, they are the sort of people we most celebrate. To them, the world is more stable. On the other side, uh, they are living at subsistence wages. They are working most of the time. It's a very competitive economy. Their habits are whatever it takes uh, to win in these uh, economic competitions. Uh, most of them, in fact, are short-term copies that last for a few hours and then and retire. There's more wealth inequality and speed inequality, which I didn't claim the slides. Uh, they do have more bigger bureaucratic firms. There's probably less nature, which may be destroyed, and less space travel. Uh, they'll have less democracy and uh, perhaps more religion and ritual. These are uh, some of the pluses and minuses. And so uh, that's my talk. Of course, I have a lot more I can say, but I'd rather uh, respond to your questions. I'm looking over here on the question list. I don't see any questions yet. Do I?
So you're asking me, is there a small change, or did you have one in mind? So in a sense, we do have machine intelligence now, of course. It just only applies to a small fraction of jobs. So uh, we do have many jobs where machines are better at them than humans. Uh, that my, my baseline prediction is that slowly increases, but slowly enough that when M's show up, uh, there's still plenty of jobs that M's can do that humans still are best at, and therefore emulations become best at. Now, the smallest change would be to say, well, that fraction is a lot larger, but it's still uh, not 100%. So even if machines can do 70% of all the jobs worth doing in terms of labor, then still, when this transition shows up, if humans are doing the other 30%, then at that point, the emulations would start doing those 30%. And the emulation world would look a lot similar, except capital would matter a lot more, because uh, capital would be getting that other 70% of income. So I mostly focus on a world where uh, computers are not um, getting that much of the income, because that's what our world is like, and that's plausibly what I would think of a continuation. But the smallest variation uh, that would have a world like this is where, again, uh, computers uh, and you know artificial intelligence software collectively got a large fraction of income, but not 100%. So there was still a lot enough for the emulations to do. Um, let me move on to now some of the questions that are listed here. And uh, as a suggestion, I will repeat the question. So um, one question from C4 Rain is. Uh, wouldn't we perpetually integrate artificially intelligent assistant algorithms into our own decision matrices and delegate our AIs to implement task-specific processes into automated avatars as on an ad needed basis? This is, seems the efficient use of energy. So this is related to the last question. Uh, so, so to elaborate, the, the key question is, what is the most cost-efficient way to do any particular job that needs a mind to do it? Uh, Obviously, uh, in our world, when we can get a computer to do a job, computers are generically vastly cheaper than humans, and so it's usually cost-effective to have the computer do a job if they can at all do it remotely uh, well. Uh, but in our world, for the vast majority of jobs that actually need done, we can't figure out a way to get the software to do it. Uh, we can't figure out how to write software and uh, you know, put, pair it with hardware such that the jobs actually get done. That is the State of the art, and even though for many centuries we've been trying to automate jobs in, in every way we could, uh, this is where we are. And if this progress has been slow, then plausibly it'll continue to be slow even for centuries. So, as I said, at the rate we've been going, at least it looks like it'll take two to four centuries until we learn how to uh, automate all the different jobs. And so, uh, if emulation show up, say, sometime in the next century, there'll still be plenty of jobs humans are doing at that point. Uh, not because we don't wish we could have machines do them, but we just don't know how. And because emulations could substitute just directly for humans, humans would have to be, um, humans don't do them, but now emulations do them. And emulations would love to hand them off to machines if they could, but they just can't. They don't know how. That's the idea of automation being hard. That's what we've seen for centuries. That's what we see now. And that's possibly what we'll see for a while. Uh, there's a question here, what does easy spur and mean uh, the uh, one of my slides I was talking about was what happens if you split off a short-term copy and then it does a few term out a job for a few hours and then ends uh, that would be easy mechanically uh, a question is would people treat it as no big deal and my claim is that in fact emulations would get into the habit of treating it as no big deal we today might be very wary of that 
But as I said, you could think about taking a drug at a party where uh, at the end of the party, uh, those memories will end and you won't remember it the next day. You could think of that as also uh, ending a creature or dying, but you don't have to think of that way. And that's my prediction for the end. They, they will in fact uh, not think it's much of a big deal. And so they will treat it as, uh, as an easy thing. Uh, William Sims Brainbridge says, uh, do you have a judgment of which methods of high resolution brain scanning may be possible, especially in the near future? And my answer is definitely no. Uh, I, I know and respect people who do brain science and uh, who do scanning research. Uh, I've even uh, donated to uh, efforts to do scanning research uh, personally, uh, but I'm going to stay agnostic about that. I'm, I'm focused on the long run. I don't that much care in the short run which technologies get forward or which research groups uh, seem to be advancing. Uh, the key point is that eventually something like this will be feasible, and I want to think about what happens when eventually it does become feasible. Uh, for any of these questions, by the way, if, if my answers don't, don't seem sufficient or, or you want to give a, ask a clarifying question, please enter them in, because I am going through these questions faster than they are appearing in the chat window. Um, uh, the next question is by Extropia de Silva. Um, the question is, in Accelerando, there is a law firm made up entirely of copies of a human lawyer. Is this inspired by your M's theory? Um, I, of course, uh, don't really know uh, who's inspired by any particular thing I've done. Certainly, the idea of brain emulations is an old idea. I didn't invent it. Uh, it goes back many decades. Uh, like I said, I've been hearing about science fiction stories and uh, also futurist speculation about what were called uploads or brain emulations for a long time. Uh, it has been a staple of conversations for a long time. Um, but what I seems to be missing is, is actually taking this stuff seriously and thinking through the social science of it. So even uh, science fiction authors, they of course uh, take it seriously enough to find a way to fit it into their stories, but they're usually looking for ways to make it dramatic or uh, interesting or keep action going, etc. But they usually don't take that much care to think through what a consistent world would be given all the social science that we know. And uh, that's the part where I think I can bring in my expertise to uh, get someone to, uh, to to work it out and find out what actually might happen. And that is my claim for this book. It's not, I'm not claiming it's inspiring. I'm not claiming I've thought through the technologies any better than other people. I'm claiming I've thought through the social science more thoroughly than other social scientists or other science fiction authors. Uh, it's not as entertaining as a story, admittedly, uh, but if you actually want to know what might really happen, uh, my claim is, I've, that out for you, or at least made the first cut. Uh, I, want, I want to make a comment on something uh, uh, our, our host said uh, earlier, which is that I think the future is important enough to have a hundred or even hundreds of books exploring different scenarios. So I don't think it's that important for me to argue that this is the most likely scenario. I think I just want to say that there are lots of plausible scenarios and we should be exploring them all. We should be studying lots of plausible future scenarios because the future is important enough to be worth having a hundred or more books exploring future scenarios. So if it's worth exploring uh, hundreds of books, it's worth exploring a scenario that says it's only a 1% chance uh, that would justify it. So I don't want to necessarily go into you know a lot of argument about which scenario is exactly the most likely. I think we should just explore a lot of these scenarios. I, of course, have used my judgment about what seems to me the most likely scenario to choose which scenarios I explore. Uh, and uh, I have, I do think this is a uh, more likely than many other scenarios, but I don't see the point in arguing for its absolute probability. I'd really rather have betting markets, as many of you know. I just like to have betting markets tell us about which scenarios seem more likely. And then those of us who are specialized in figuring out the consequence of a scenario can take the betting market odds seriously and just go with that. But in the absence of betting markets, I have to use more of my own judgment. Um, that's continuing on with the questions. Uh, is there a desire to avail a host's own voice to emulations? Um, I think I don't understand that. I'll have to ask uh, Lori to uh, clarify or rephrase that. I just don't understand. But I will I'll give you priority when that shows up. Um, 
wealthy. Linda, how can a mere human invest in order to be wealthy in an M world? Well, um, as you probably know, because uh, you've been told by uh, decent investing advisors, as most of you probably know, the standard finance or economist advice to everybody is that unless uh, you know enough to make a bet whereby you'll beat somebody else at your bet, the simplest thing to do is just invest in everything in proportion to its market price. Uh, this is called an index fund, i.e. don't make bets about what's likely to be valuable in the future. The simplest thing to do is just invest in everything. Now, one correction to that is if you have a particular tax status, which means some investments are cheaper to you than others because of taxes. Another correction is because uh, you have uh, preferences or demands that are different from other people. So, for example, if you plan on staying in one country versus another country, then you probably want more assets that are tied to performance in that country because uh, you'll want to spend that uh, those assets in that country. Uh, if you say a human invest, of course, what one thing a human might do is to uh, make sure that uh, you invest in assets that are valuable for humans. And so uh, one, one very straightforward thing I think most everybody might do if they were available is to is have an insurance asset or an M bond as I call it, i.e. just an asset that pays off if the emulation world shows up. If you invest in that asset, then you have this asset that pays off in that scenario. Now you're not poor in that scenario. You have an asset that pays off in that scenario. Now, uh, the more that you understand particular things, the more you might be willing to make bets. But again, Every time you make a bet, you're usually making a bet against somebody else on the other side who's betting the opposite. So you really have to think you know better than these other people you're betting with. But the kinds of bets you might consider making are, of course, which particular industries show up, or which geographic regions might be most possible. A lot of the wealth will go to the people who own the land under the major M cities, because they'll concentrate in a small number of M cities. Of course, people will own patents and uh, technology company stock, uh, and companies that make the M's and service them and, and make the computers that they run on. Uh, things like that. Those are all uh, plausible things that you might do to try to make bets and do better than average. But honestly, the, the standard investment advice is to just get the average. <laughs> just uh, invest in an index fund or perhaps some sort of insurance progress product, product to just make sure that you have assets in this world. So um, the next question, I think it says, um, I think that's Extropia uh, trying to answer Linda's question there and next on the list. So I'm going to jump down to Lori because I promised to uh, give her a priority uh, because I didn't understand the question before. Um, and then I'll jump back. Lori says, is there a desire to or a program that will give an emulation or AI representation of a person that that person's own voice? Say it performs a task on behalf of someone, will it do so in a manner indistinguishable from the host? Um, I don't know. So I, I, I think the I, question is uh, when you are being uh, acting on behalf of someone in general uh, as an emulation, in the emulation world in a virtual reality, you don't have to take on your personal appearance, either in sound or visually. You could take on the appearance of someone else. Um, but of course, uh, that might be confusing. So. My main analytical technique in understanding the emulation world is efficiency, i.e. what gets things done. So the question is, when is it efficient for uh, someone to basically present themselves as someone they're not? So I expect, like, for example, an important person in a meeting um, might, you know, might imagine that they would uh, sometimes not be there in person and just put somebody else there in place of them, but not tell the other people that they substituted someone. That is, they're an important person, and why should they... Uh, you know, why shouldn't they put a cheaper person in their place to, uh, if, if it's not that important? I think that intuition comes from our world where people have widely differing costs of time. But in the emulation world, that's just not true. Uh, it's really just as cheap for you to split off a copy who substitutes for you than it is to get anybody else to take your place. And so I really can't see the advantage of having somebody else pretend to be you when you could just have you be you, except you won't remember it. So the, the key trade-off more is when you split off copies of yourself, where you don't remember what they say and you won't learn from what they hear or do, uh, those to other people will be just as real as you, but they might be more worried, am I talking to the mainline version of this person or am I talking to a copy? So uh, in that case, you know, they might as well give their realistic sound and, and image, i.e. so that it's not to confuse people. Perhaps they'll also even give some sort of clue in the sound or image that, hey, this is a spur copy, this isn't the original, uh, depending on whether they want to communicate uh, that piece of information to other people. Let me go back to uh, 
um, William Cambridge. He says, your answer to the question about brain scanning was quite good, but we need not know today which method will work, but at least one might, given the goal of the project. Uh, then he asks, how does your scenario change if uploading of human personality is possible at low or medium fidelity, but not high fidelity? So I guess it depends on what you mean by the fidelity of personality. Um, so uh, there's, there's the idea that you can have a partial mind, i.e. not a full brain, but a small part of a brain that's much cheaper than a brain, and it might be good enough for some task. Uh, but of course, if we can make partial minds that are much smaller than full minds, and they are good enough for tasks, they probably will do that. My guess is that initially, at least, that's just not going to be possible. The human brains have just too much integration of many different parts, and you can't really just rip out one part to do most tasks. Uh, that's different from the question of whether uh, an emulation is really a close match to any particular human, or whether it is um, something that's relatively different. So you could imagine... I think this is what he has in mind, that uh, we take an amalgam of many different brains that we scan and we make a more generic uh, emulation, and this emulation isn't that close to any particular human. It's just somewhat similar uh, to a number of humans, and that it works and that uh, it eventually, you know, it's the kind of emulation that dominates the emulation economy. If, but... Once the world is dominated by emulations, I don't think it that much matters how close any one of them is to any one human. The humans are way off in the margins. They don't really matter that much anyway. Certainly, any one emulation, once it has developed experiences and uh, you know, friends and uh, skills, then it will be a very specific thing. It may acquire personality from that process. And if it makes a copy of itself at that point, that copy will be very close to that original in terms of its skills and memories and everything else. So. In that sense of personality, uh, they would be very close. Uh, that's the similarity between two emulations, one of whom is a copy of another. That's a different question than the similarity of an emulation to whatever human it was scanned from. And again, if you are averaging many humans, then it might not be a similar. All right, so now we're back on the main line of the questions here. And now we're down to C4 Rain, who asks, where does additive manufacturing, add, excuse me, additive manufacturing, and open source code play into the financial model. One could print them that resource and construct printers out of the item all on sunlight. Wouldn't that crush an economic model? Uh, no. So additive manufacturing uh, is a form of local manufacturing. Uh, the more that there is additive manufacturing, the less that stuff will be transported. Uh, things would be made locally, but um, you know the, the factories. Uh, cost, the raw materials they use cost, the design uh, cost, the marketing costs. There's still lots of costs even in that of manufacturing. So uh, you do need an economy to allocate those resources uh, that are used in that of manufacturing. Uh, open source code uh, is a kind of uh, way that people make things in order to, uh, for status and for social bonding, and they don't necessarily charge for them. Uh, people can, of course, do that in the emulation world too. Uh, but that doesn't uh, mean the rest of the economy doesn't exist. I talk in the book about open source lovers. Uh, that is uh, an emulation who says, well, um, if you'll pay for my runtime, you can make a copy of me and, uh, you know, give it a chance of whether there's a spark between us. And if there is, uh, I'll be your lover. But, uh, you know, you'll have to pay for it. So that's someone who's basically saying, uh, my source, my, you know, who I am, you, it's free to make a copy and use it as long as you meet certain constraints. Uh, that certainly can fit in this world, but it doesn't mean that, that there isn't an economy here, because of course uh, the resources it takes to uh, emulate this open source lever uh, takes real resources. They run on real computers with real energy and cooling and all of that cost. Um, um, so I think some people here on the line are answering other people's questions and talking to them. So let's see. William, 2040. Five asks, what about having a neural interface where the copy can transfer the mind file back to the main line? So uh, in the book, I, I do, for most of the book, explicitly assume that we can't merge copies. That does simplify everything. But I, at the end, I do discuss what happens if you can merge copies. And I think really the key question is, if you weren't able to merge copies, uh, presumably the idea of a merge is that the merge copy would have the memories of 
both of the originals and it would have the new skills acquired by both of the originals. Uh, that is, if you split them into several copies and had different experiences and learned different skills, the merged version would have all of those memories, all of those skills. Now, a key question is, if as a function of having um, experiences and uh, learning skills, we become slowly more fragile over time, does this merged version have the sum of all the fragility that has been accumulated by each of the uh, versions. If, if that's true, then that will greatly detract from the economic value of merging. Uh, emulations, the, there are two main costs for running an emulation. One is the physical cost of the computer they run on it and the energy and cooling, etc. And the other is the fragility that's acquired by aging because of that experience. And that second cost is not avoided here. And so uh, you might rather not uh, remember things that add to your uh, aging process if uh, they don't have a commensurate value. So emulations will in fact tend to go more the other way. Uh, each thing they think of doing, they ask themselves, not only is this worth doing, but is this worth remembering? And many things will be worth doing, but not worth remembering, i.e. the experience of doing it, yes, uh, you will have more memories, but that will also add to your aging and fragility, and maybe it's just not worth bothering with that. And so uh, the main re reason I can see merging being attractive is just if uh, you somehow don't get that aging added together but that seems hard to me to imagine uh, unless there's just is no aging and nothing's wrong about aging uh, so that the next question is really the same question again um i in uh kills people david brings book david brings book kills people is in my judgment the best uh book I've seen in science fiction to try to describe these sorts of processes. Uh, he does have uh, people coming back at the end of the day to merge their experiences and he doesn't uh, address the relative aging issue. And um, so uh, I would say that yes, it, you know, again, if there is no aging cost of merging and if, and it's possible, then yes, uh, people might do it, but uh, I see that it poses barriers. Um, And I think I'm now at the end of questions here, as far as I can tell. And I miss hearing other people's voices. It's kind of odd here for me to be talking, and uh, I hear you typing things, and I speak it back, but uh, I only ever hear my voice. Any other questions? We have gone almost an hour here. William asks, uh, what kind of research am I doing now? I have a second book coming out uh, roughly a year from now. And uh, it's on hypocrisy. Uh, the title is The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. So it's not very much on the topic of this book. Uh, it's on a topic I've been working on for a, a few years, actually, on my blog and elsewhere. Uh, it's with a co-author, Kevin Simler, and it's basically written now. It's, it's out and under review. I have a, a third area is that I've just gotten a grant, and, and in a few weeks I hope to be able to tell everybody about the grant. I, I can't tell you that much about its sponsor and in detail uh, at the moment, but what I can say is that I'll be trying to explore another scenario of how artificial intelligence might appear. So uh, in my slide about the different uh, routes to artificial intelligence, I said uh, one route is just we could slowly keep accumulating better software as we've been doing for the last 70 years. And that seems to me the right sort of um, first cut baseline scenario that we should have analyzed in the first place. That is, uh, many people have opinions about artificial intelligence and what will make it possible, and they often have opinions about there'll be some brand new discovery that uh, is based on some new principle or insight. And they differ all across the map about what those new principles or insights might be and, and what consequences they'll have. And so it seems to me what we want is a baseline analysis of what happens if they're all wrong and AI software is pretty much like all the software we've ever seen up until now. So we have had 70 years of experience with software and we do see very consistent patterns and trends in the you know, what it takes to make software, and what are the difficulties in making software, what are the costs of generality, what are the costs of integrating large, uh, different, diverse systems, uh, what are the uh, inputs required to make software, 
uh, we have all of this literature on software, and it seems to me we should just take that literature and apply it and say, what happens if we slowly over centuries accumulate more and better software just the way we've been doing, and that's how we reach AI. And so I want to analyze that scenario, i.e., what if AI is just like all the other software we've seen? That's not necessarily a strong claim that that's true, but now it can be the basis for comparison. If you want to introduce a hypothesis about how AI is fundamentally different from ordinary software, it's now up to you to specify in all these terms in the language uh, that we will provide and that other people have provided in software engineering, how exactly you think AI software is different than other software, and then we can use that hypothesis to uh, explore how your alternative scenario might play out based on your assumptions about how software will end up being different uh, later than it is in the past. So that's my, uh, I have a three-year grant, and I'll be working on that for the next three years, and, and hopefully another book will come out of that. And now we have been here for an hour. I'm happy to stay around for uh, as long as anyone wants to uh, chat about these things. Uh, any more questions? Here we go. I'm not sure it is a question, though. It's not good. So. I, I, I'm interested in asking the rest of you questions, of course. Um, that is, many of you have been uh, in this area of futurism for a long time, like I have, and uh, I want to know what um, you think of a project like this. That is, uh, I wrote a paper in 1994, uh, basically, um, outlining the very basics of this sort of scenario and what the economics might look like, and then basically no one else really picked that up much since then to, to do much with it, but that was, uh, you know, I guess 22 years ago now. And, uh, uh, you know, so there seems to be relatively little interest in the world in this sort of analysis, uh, and I'm wondering, you know, what you think about the value of this sort of analysis or its uh, usefulness or, or how it sits next to other kinds of contributions to futurism. Uh, again, this seemed to me a very valuable thing to do, uh, given the kind of tools that I have. But uh, I'd like to know what the rest of you think about where this sorts of work sits and then what it role it should have and uh, what the point, if anything, is of doing this sort of thing. If any of you have opinions on that. So, so uh, C4 Rain says all futures play a role in advocating and informing. And um, I have a very explicitly separated an advocacy from an informing role here. That is, I've taken a stance of being an analyst and just uh, taking an assumption about a future scenario and just trying to work out its consequences, uh, not advocating for it per se, but presuming that other people would then certainly be willing to uh, talk about whether they liked it or not and what they might want to do to encourage it or not. Uh, but, you know, how valuable do you think is analysis relative to advocacy? Uh, obviously, one sort of my, my almost key question is, can I convince you or other people that it's possible to take a future scenario and analyze it in a lot more detail than has been done so far? So honestly, I've never seen, maybe I missed it somewhere, any sort of analysis of a future scenario in this much detail. Even the status quo scenario of things pretty much don't change. Um, so it surprises me that people haven't tried to go into this much detail analyzing a future scenario before. Uh, is it just that I'm unusually uh, obsessed with, or perhaps unusually skilled, or is it just that there isn't really that much interest in this sort of detailed analysis of the scenario? Uh, C4 Rain says analysis is difficult in the face of social linearity. Um, I'm not sure what that means. 
Um, and William 2045 says of books like Third Wave or Megatrends were attempts at this. Uh, and how much detail did they get into? My, my recollection from those books is uh, they didn't get into as much detail analyzing consequences, not surprisingly. Um, and they weren't sort of using as much sort of straightforward social science analysis uh, as I'm trying to do here. But I, I don't remember them very well, so maybe I'm just remembering them. William Bainbridge says uh, he tends to be influenced by Dark Ages scenario, by certain authors, and left academic sociology after it became narrowly left wing. Um, I'd you know, be interested in, uh, I guess, looking up those references and finding more. And, and uh, Are they social science sort of analyses that, that try to analyze a scenario in some detail, uh, given uh, you know, particular assumptions and, and just or do a standard thing? I, I don't know. I'd like to know. They're like, and again, at this point, I'd, I'd actually, uh, I don't know what our host thinks. I might suggest that uh, people could, like, at least one by one, turn on their sound and say something because uh, it sure sounds quiet in here to me. Uh, yeah, so the so William, William 2045 says, uh, uh, there's lots of advocacy oriented books. And so, you know, this is somewhat of a interesting thing to notice that it, in most of social science, um, most social science isn't very, doesn't focus on advocacy, although some does, but in futurism, it seems like most of the focus is on advocacy. So why we have so much more focus on uh, advocacy regarding futurism relative to analysis than we do in the rest of social science. Uh, yes, of course, some ag advocacy is important to do, but it also needs some analytical foundations. So somebody has to figure out what's likely to happen if we do nothing before we recommend what to do. I'm happy to make the slides available if, if there's a place to post them. Um, as I said, yeah. some of the slides yeah. I seem to have disappeared uh, in the set for some reason, but. Um, And, and again, I'm, I'm happy to come back and answer questions textually if I just know where to go. I, you know, you have to tell me where exactly to show up to get the text. Uh, you mean come here or do not have another one? Happy to do it. Thank you all for coming. So